Alright everybody, today we're going to be making this awesome light show inside of the Construct 3 video game engine. I had a lot of fun putting this together. This is awesome. Hi everybody, this is Joe slash Fuzzle CC, and today we're going to be covering two relatively more advanced effects inside of Construct 3. I will put the project in the link down below that you can download from my itch page so that you can go through it at your own pace. I will be only hitting the highlights. So the first effect that we're going to be covering is how to do some relatively advanced lighting and shadows. The second effect that we're going to be covering is how to sync certain objects in your game to the music that you are playing in your game as well. So let's dive into the first one around lighting and shadows. All right, so big call out right away to Mr. Skyman here. Uh, he put together the tutorial that this is based off of. So definitely go and read through his tutorial. He does a really nice job covering a number of items related to lighting and the canvas and how to do shadows inside of this tutorial. Big thank you, Skyman. This was awesome. I loved going through this and building my content on top of it. All right, so let's go into the editor. So we're going to be making this Bat Hunter game that we already saw a little bit of a preview uh, for. So we've got these caves on either side. We've got these helper sprites and bats are spawning randomly and going across just with a bolt behavior to a random cave. And they're carrying this, you know, gem object here uh, on their little rope. And this is what's going to be glowing right and it's going to have random colors and all these things and if you happen to tap on the bat uh, which i didn't show in the preview it will actually uh throw a fireball hit the bat bat will die he'll drop the gem and the gem will be sucked in by the mage and that's kind of what we're going to make today so getting back to the lighting effect inside of the skyman tutorial there's basically a few key things that we have to keep in mind first of all for each of these lights we're going to have a number of objects first we're going to have this helper sprite called light source and it's gonna carry a number of instance variables, including the radius, the size of how much the glow is, and we're actually gonna be modulating that to the music. And then it's gonna have the R, G, and B values that we're gonna use for the coloring. It's gonna have some variables controlling the size of the shadows. It's also gonna have the ability to blur the shadows, which I thought was a really cool effect. Uh, so if you put the sharpness value here and some of these blur min and max angles, it will actually do some really cool blurring effect on the shadows themselves. This last thing I'm not gonna use, which is shivering, I've actually, because I'm pulsing the to the music already, this is if you wanted to, you can implement the shivering behavior and it ties to the sign behavior that's on this other object, which is the light circle, which is what you're actually seeing being changed in size and color that's gonna be right on top of this light source in the game engine. The other objects that we need to make this effect work is a drawing canvas, which we've named shadow. This is really important. This is what's actually going to be used for the shadow effect itself. And then we also are gonna make use of the shadow light plugin uh, sprite, which you'll see in a moment how that's utilized. So between these objects that we have in a container together, the shadow light, the shadow canvas, the light source, the light circle, and then also this gem, which it's all gonna be kind of child to, uh, we're able to make this cool effect. So let's jump into the event sheet and see how it's done. So in my main, I'm including two event sheets, a Z order, it's taking everything on a layer and it's force ranking it by its Y. And then we're also including this light event sheet. Okay, so now we're inside of the light event sheet and inside the light event sheet, take everything down to its simplest high level view. They're gonna do some a few things right in the beginning, which is for each light source, we're going to clear the canvas and we're gonna paste the light circle without effects and the shadow light without effects. And then there's a whole section related to the pasting shadows, which we'll cover in a moment. And then there's a utility here for every single time you create a light source, you wanna also make sure that the other objects that are created with it, because it's in a container, are appropriately managed to being moved to the right layer, as well as certain properties are being set, including the color, the opacity, the position, all those things. So whenever you create a light source, this section is really just handling that creation. And then similarly, whenever you create what's called a shadow caster, which is an important concept inside this tutorial, there is a family group here that has three objects that I've decided I wanna have shadows. One is my bat, one is my fireball, and the third is my mage. They've got a few key uh, instance variables here. One is is shadow, which will be useful later for you determining which of your sprites are shadows and which is your real sprite. And you'll need that in your event sheet as a condition normally in some of the actions that you're trying to take. The master UID. So if you are a shadow, 
who are you a shadow of and record that master UID here. Uh, this destroy we actually don't end up using and then the initial opacity, okay? And it does have the behavior of shadow caster. And once you create your shadow caster, there's just a little bit of initialization that's done here around the layer. So let's go back on up to the main section, which is pasting shadows. And this is really the main trick of this tutorial. So right away, um, for each shadow caster, and we covered that, that's one of the families that we created. So for every single bat, for every single fireball, for every single mage, for every single one that is not a shadow. So that's like the real thing, right? Not the shadow sprites that we're gonna be creating. What we're going to do is loop through them and we're gonna set up a number of initial variables that we're gonna need to make use of, including the layer it's on, the original X and Y, the max X, the max Y, heights, the current animation, because one of the really cool things about this effect is that the shadow is actually playing the animation of what it is the shadow of, which is really cool. Um, so that, that was one of my favorite things about this. And then you're also gonna understand what frame you're on and all those other good things, the UID and opacity. So what you do is for every single one of those, you wanna pick the light source where, that you're within range of. So there might be more than one light source, which is you know one of the really cool things about how this is implemented. So if you have lots of different lights, maybe you have torches on walls, and your character is walking in between them, this can actually produce a shadow effect for every single light source, which is how it would work in real life. You're then going to set up these variables related to layer height, original X, Y, all that good stuff. We're gonna disable some of this because we're using pooling. And then what we're using is coming into here, we're gonna pick all the shadow casters. We're going to do, you know, for each light source, we're going to try to find a shadow caster that already has the UID for the object that we're trying to pass paste the shadow for so that we aren't creating destroying creating destroying we're trying to find one well hey i already i already created one before let's just keep using the same one what you can then do is you can do a nice lerp here which we won't really be covering how that works but it's using the rg and b and the light source strength as well as this progress variable related to the distance between the items and that gives you a nice addition on top of your rg and b that we're going to use for the coloring Okay, so now we're gonna come on down here and what we're gonna do is we're gonna look and say, hey, do I have a shadow caster where the master UID is equal to the UID? If I do, let's use that. If I don't, let's go ahead and create one. Now I did add a little modification to what was originally provided by Skyman here. I wanted to make sure that if my shadow caster is mirrored, I want the shadow to be mirrored as well. If it is not mirrored, you don't have to worry about it. So uh, that's what this, you know, is mirrored and else check is doing. And then this is replicated for each one. So what I can do is basically say, I right, go ahead and let's create the object. And if it is mirrored, I wanna set this to being mirrored also. So the shadow, if my bat's flying this way, I don't want the mirror, sorry, the shadow to look like it's flying the other way. I wanna make it look like it's flying in the same direction. And then I'm also going to make sure that I set the is shadow to true because it is a shadow. I'm gonna set all these other items uh, just make sure it's all set up correctly. And then I'm gonna come on down. This is where I can then go in and make sure that I also set the appropriate angle and distance and multiplier so that I can then position this thing correctly. So once I've done that, I've set my angle, I've set my current animation correctly. So if my bat's flying, my shadow's flying, I'm setting the frame to the right frame. I'm scaling it appropriately based off some of my input variables. And from there, I can come on down and I can also introduce the sharpness effect, which is really cool. So if you don't set it to 100, it will actually do this really cool blur. And then this is where the final magic happens, where you are pasting the object, the shadow caster without effects onto the canvas. So that was a lot of work to effectively get a sprite positioned correctly, doing the right animation, turning the angle appropriately relative to light source, scaling it, possibly blurring it, and then pasting the resulting effect without effects onto that canvas. Skyman does a nice job going to why this is, you know, why this works well, but this is where the final action occurs to actually make it show up. Coming on down here, we already covered this. So that is lighting and shadows as fast as I could cover it. Like I said, link down below to you know, take a look at how this is working. Now that we've gone through that, let's go ahead and give this a play and just kind of talk to it a little bit uh, more directly. So 
right now I've got that sharpness set below 100, so you can see this nice blur effect, right? If I hadn't done that, these would be crisp sprites, just like the sprite themselves is, because that's what we're pasting uh, onto the canvas. And you can see some are mirrored, some are not mirrored, because of the check that we put in place. And it's doing the same animation as the sprite itself. And so all these things taken together is really doing something pretty cool. Now we haven't covered how this is all being moved across the screen yet and how it's being synced to music, so let's go ahead and cover that now. But I do love these jams. <laughs> okay, so continuing on. So let's talk about how inside of our main script we are achieving the audio effect and also moving these things around. I'm not going to cover this section. This is all related to on a timer I'm spawning my bats. When I spawn them, I do some initial random coloring of a variable of R, G, and B. I assigned that all to be positioned correctly, and I'm using parent-child relationships to move that across the screen. But this is a relatively simple uh, thing, but take a look in here if you need to. This is just how I'm kind of initializing everything when I create and spawn a new bat. All these other things need to come along so it's ready to go. I need the light source, the light circle, the gem, the shadow, the shadow light, those are all things that I need. And I'm constraining it to the gem and the gem's constrained to the bat. All right, so that's spawn. And I'm doing it on both sides. I have two things that can end the life of the bat. It can either reach the cave or a fireball can hit it. So when the cave is reached, it's just doing a few things where I'm destroying it. And I'm also doing something where I'm checking to make sure that I destroy the shadows associated with it as well. Otherwise your object count will continue to increase over time. So make sure you implement some sort of check like that so you don't see your shadow count continuing to increase if you do this effect. On bat death, it's very similar. The only thing that's a little bit here is I do have a death animation for the bat. And I also do this little tweak to the bullet that the bat is using as a behavior to move, where instead of it continuing onward on its path, it actually changes its speed a little bit and it changes the range of the angle of motion to the direction of the angle of motion of the fireball that's hitting it. So let's demonstrate that real quick. All right, so let's hit this guy. Boom. All right, boom. And previous tutorial, link up above, covered how to do the math of two intersecting objects using their speed and original positions. You can actually automatically make sure that the tra trajectory of like a fireball or cannonball will like automatically hit that thing. So that's what I'm using here. So there's no chance that my mage misses if, uh, if he's attacking this guy. Okay, so continuing on. Uh, our audio effects. Let's jump into that. That's what the second effect is. And this is actually a lot simpler. So let's dive right in. What we really need is we need the RMS level of the song that we're playing. Now inside of Construct, if you come in here and you type in audio in the editor, this audio analyzer uh, template comes up that you can go ahead and give a look. And it does a really nice job of quickly describing how to use the audio analyzer inside of Construct 3. So if you're playing a song, you can add this analyzer effect to that song. And once you do that, you have access to a number of variables such as your RMS value, which is really the magic of how to make that thing pulse to the music. So what they've done here is they've just tied the width of a sprite to the audio.analyzer RMS level of the song audio. It's the first effect, so it's you know base zero, and they're multiplying it by two. That's the way that they did it. I used a little bit different math, but I did essentially the exact same thing. So let's come on back to our editor here. What I'm doing is that light source, we can control how large the radius is of that light effect, the circle, by setting the radius here. And what I'm doing is a, a min light radius. So I, don't, I always want it to be at least some value. And then what I'm also doing is I'm saying the min of 250, so I don't want it to go above 250 in case there's some weird spike in the RMS, I'm kind of controlling that. And then I'm saying the absolute value of the RMS ref plus the RMS level raised to the third divided by three. So I put in this RMS ref value of 20. If you look at the values, they're typically the RMS levels are coming in at like negative 15, negative 17, and you can go in and look inside of the Construct 3 documentation, what that all means. But I'm basically setting that and I'm trying to really focus in on the difference occurring inside the music so I can get a more elaborate effect of the pulsing here. And then I take that value, say the difference is seven, I set, I raise it to the third 
and then I'm dividing by three. This was me just tweaking these values to find what I thought was visually interesting. Feel free to tweak it to what you guys would like inside of your game. Okay, once I do that, I'm able to hit play and boom, you know, alongside of the, uh, the music now, my audio analyzers were turning that RMS value. And when you hear this like kind of clap starting, you hear it like, you know, pop, you see it visually. And that's just a really cool effect, I think. It does take a decent amount of processing power, but you know, it's pretty cool. So let's go ahead and finish this thing out. There are some state machines that I'm using. You know, feel free to look at some of my other tutorials related to state machines. I'm basically just passing the animations of if my mage is, you know, attacking or if he is uh, idle, go through and do all these different things. That's not the point of this tutorial today, so I won't cover it, but definitely feel free to download below, go through it at your own pace. There was one other special kind of uh, attack that I wanted to show off before we wrap up. And this was every fifth attack. I wanted him to actually shoot fireballs at every single bat on the screen. So I believe this will be the next one. Oh, boom. <laughs> and there is a pretty cool effect if you dig into the code where I'm actually doing this kind of interesting sucking the gem into the player and using a tween effect for that. So give that a, give that a look as well if you're digging through the event sheet. Now that said, guys, uh, special call out to a couple of the artists that helped make some of the artwork and music for this game. Uh, the first is Patrial. Very nice job on those beats. You can actually download this song as well as another song by him on my itch page. I called it Eerie Space Music because at the time I was thinking about using it for a space game, but go ahead and give it a download. Also, that mage is totally available for free from Ray Monkey on my itch page. So give that a download as well. I commissioned that when I hit 100 subscribers. And by the way, today I hit 200 subscribers. So thank you so much to everybody uh, for subscribing to my channel. If you did enjoy this content, please consider subscribing. Uh, it does make a big difference for me and it's free for you to do and it always makes my day. So with that said, everybody, have a nice day. Hopefully this was useful for you and come back and watch some of my videos in the future. Have a good one.